video. And Professor Shakya, thank you for, again for the introduction. And um, this is a great honor for me to be here. And uh, yesterday as we were touring in uh, the old city and we went to a neighborhood that is belonging to the Shakyan um, families. I was very, very much impressed by the, by the simple fact that I heard the name Shakya. And because, well, it's the same family where the Buddha came from. So, and now I see there are people from that family here in this room. So I, I'm really humbled to be giving a talk on the Dhamma to members of the Shakya family. So, um, so that really uh, is, uh, you know, it's very humbling. And uh, as I mentioned to you, Professor, it's, uh, it's extremely um, pleasing for any teacher of the Dhamma to share um, whatever we have learned, whether it's through studying and especially through our practice with other teachers and other students of the Dhamma. So when the opportunity came, when the suggestion was made for me to give the talk, I just quickly jumped on it because, um, especially given the nature of the talk itself, the Brahma Viharas, the four uh, key elements in what in English is poorly translated as the divine abidings, are qualities of mind, qualities of feeling, qualities, qualities of, of uh, human experience that are extremely necessary in the world today. So it's extremely essential for us to approach it in that fashion. Um, I say in the world today because we're all living in a digital world. Everything is online we are having less and less and less interactions with each other as human beings. I was mentioning something to, to someone not too long ago. Uh, we're human beings. We're very skilled. And this is something that we can bring from our animal ancestry. We're very skilled at identifying facial expressions, bodily gestures, vocal tones, you know, in the 80s, there was a professor, I believe, from uh, UCLA. His, his name was Professor Mehrabian, um, who did a research on this. His experiment involved uh, looking at how much of human communication takes place through uh, words, verbal communication. So, how important are words that we use? And he was completely surprised to find out that words are not that important. His experiment resulted in proving that in fact only 7% of our communication has to do with words. It's verbal. Real communication takes place non-verbally. That is through expression of eyes, bodily shapes. If I'm talking to you like this, it means one thing. If I'm talking to you like this with open hands, it's totally different. One of my teachers, he, um, whenever he gives Dhamma talks, if he sees anyone sitting like this, or feet crossed like this, he would not give a talk. Because you find that also in the texts where the Buddha himself refused to give the talk. Because they were sitting like this, the monks, some of them. So psychologists also have uh, looked at that phenomena. And apparently the brain locks out a portion of its attentive power. So it has less acceptability of any new data coming in, any new information coming in by you sitting like this. So if you're in a relationship and, or you're going to a job interview and you sit like this, you're telling your interviewer or your partner or your family member or your teachers, 
professors. Yeah, I'm here. I'm kind of respecting you, but my brain is locked. I'm not listening to most of the things you're going to say. So anyhow, long story short, 93% is nonverbal communication. Tone, uh, so um, eye contact, etc., bodily uh, positions, etc. So now, when you look at that in the context of the Brahma Viharas, which by the way are four, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upekha. Now I'm not going to just talk about uh, mostly of their um, technical definitions, what they are. I mean, I will touch upon them uh, here and there, but the most focus will be laid on their practical aspect. Today. I say today again because I was sitting with uh, very, very close individuals in my life, and they have two children, beautiful children, and I love them very much. And uh, we were playing together, this and that, and then eventually, these children ended up getting their iPads, you know, iPads to play with their games. And they were so lively when they were together. They were so much having, you know, so much fun playing this and that. But when they took the iPads in their hands, their attention went into this. And that is the world we're living in. The expression, almost gone. Your connection with another human being, almost gone. You're living in a bubble. Now that is a problem because we, as human beings, we are social beings. We need to connect and we need to bond. Even the monks and nuns in the time of the Buddha were not living like islands. At some point, at least during the day, they had to go into Pindapada. Alms food collecting. Even the Buddha had to do that. So there was always communication with other human beings, with other monks or nuns. And the monastics, as a part of their contribution, they had to give Dhamma talks after they were served meals, especially when they were invited into people's homes. Now, when you think about this, you can also see how the Buddha saw the value of bringing this extra quality, the Brahma Viharas, in changing a person's way of functioning, in changing a person's way they view the world. Okay, let's put that aside for now. When we talk about Buddhist meditation, Majority of the time, when we look at Buddhist practice and also the, uh, the instructions that are given throughout the centuries, especially where this focus is going to be mostly, uh, the, this lecture is going to be mostly on um, the Pali Nikayas, the earliest tradition that we can find in this uh, tradition of Buddhism. So, there we see, even to this day, the attention being laid on the practice of the breath as a method, as an object of meditation, majority of the time. Now, given the fact that the Buddha officially, within this tradition, talked about um, 40 kamatanas, so um, 40 objects of meditation, even though some people say, Oh, thank you. Even though the Buddha uh, is said to have given over 84,000 different types of meditation objects. So that's, a, that's not a necessarily a scientific number or whatever. It just gives you the idea that it was many different types of meditation objects. So today, most of the time that teachers give instruction to students, they're giving them breath meditation. And for that, you have Anapanasati Sutta that you can go to. 
uh, which is really, it stands out. I myself practiced it for over 20 years, breath meditation. Not just in uh, Theravada practice, but also when I was uh, in my journey in Mahayana practice. Uh, and specifically when I used to do Zen meditation, Japanese Zen meditation. However, 20 years after 20 years of doing this, I did one weekend, um, actually, let me rephrase that, one 10-day uh, retreat in California with uh, one of my teachers. And um, I just saw, said to myself, you know, I have nothing to lose. Because part of me wanted to keep clinging. In Buddhism, we have a term called upadana, clinging. It's part of the 12 links of causation, paticca samutpada. In Sanskrit, it's pratitya samutpada. One of them is upadana. We can also have upadana towards our meditation object. So I said, wait, wait, wait. Why don't I give this 10 days meditation retreat a chance? I will do whatever I can in this 10 days block and do whatever my teacher asks me to. I have nothing to lose. If it doesn't work, I'll go back to my breath meditation. Now I was already practicing Buddhist. I was already studying Buddhism for many years before this. So when I was reintroduced to the suttas, I saw how the Buddha had talked and explained about the breath meditation about eight times in the whole Nikayas, thousands and thousands of pages, many, many suttas, but eight times. But we still focus on the breath meditation as the technique that the Buddha talked about. Thank you very much. Now, I began to see that the Buddha had actually talked about the Brahma Viharas, especially Metta, over a hundred times. Eight times versus a hundred times. And I was wanting to actually see how much of this is truthful. So I looked at the suttas, and you see how many people came in, and they didn't necessarily have the ability to sit down and analyze. They weren't scholars. Many of them were fishermen. Many of them were farmers or, or, or uh, royalty, kings, queens, uh, businessmen, all these people. So they were not you know, uh, people who could have time to sit down and meditate and watch their breath, but they could bring their attention to how they were feeling and thinking towards how they were dealing with one another. So this takes us back to the first thing which we were talking about in relation to our human contact. Connection, connectability. Today, modern day uh, psychologists, soci sociologists, social workers, therapists are all seeing the value of Yes, connection between people. In therapeutic uh, circles, we call this relational, relational work. And I myself work with clients, patients, young kids sometimes, and their parents, that the connection is gone, it's, it's disconnected. Partners, husband, wife, etc., they are not communicating together properly. They don't even look at each other. Now, the Buddha realized this 26 centuries earlier. Now, interestingly enough, when uh, we are uh, looking at um, origins of Brahma Viharas, we start to see, okay, 
How did the word begin? Where did the word come from, Brahma Viharas? Why Brahma Viharas? Now, at the time of the Buddha, there was his contemporaries in Brahmanism. Um, there was um, always an effort, which we also now find in Buddhist circles, unfortunately, um, where there's this emphasis of wanting to be reborn at a heavenly realm, in a heavenly realm. Um, in one of my talks I've given in the past, um, I brought this subject up because when I was searching, pursuing, in the beginning uh, stages of my uh, Buddhist path, um, Nibbana, I wanted to experience Experience, Nibbana, I wanted to taste it. Is it real? Is it real? Is it real? So I used to go to different monks and nuns, different traditions, all the three traditions I went to. I had teachers from all three different traditions in different lineages. But what I was unanimously getting was, ultimately, you can hope for being reborn in a Deva Loka, even a heavenly realm. And you can do many, many good things now, so you can gain a lot of merits now for later life. But no one was telling me that Nibbana was possible now in this life, in this skin, while I'm alive, before I get cremated. No one was guaranteeing me that. And I said, why is that? There's a problem here. Because when I look back to the suttas and I'm hearing the words of the Buddha, he's saying to all these people, farmers, intellectuals, and all these people that were coming to him, yes, you can experience Nibbana now. So what's the difference? Why yes at the time of the Buddha, why not now? See, we are lucky enough to be born in a human being body as humans, in a time where we can still hear the Dhamma, we can talk about the Dhamma, we can go and pay respect to the, to the Dhamma. Okay. That means we are living at a time where Nibbana is possible. So this is a point that many teachers um, are still advocating but not as much as they used to about 20 years ago, because now there's more of a revival going on. And that has to do with individuals like yourselves who are seeking an answer by looking at the suttas, trying to find some inspiration, some answer, because it's the easiest thing to go and hope for another time, another life. I have no guarantees. Maybe I might be a monkey next life. Or maybe if I could even come back as a human being, there might not be a Dhamma. Then it would be a really dark age. So even if I'm living in a heavenly realm and I don't have access to the Dhamma, that's hell. Really, because the time will come because of anicca, impermanence. You're going to fall back because of samsara. We're going to fall back from that state. Fall back into what? We don't know. So what you can and do and have control over is what you do right now. And that's where do we get to the word the Buddha introduced, chetana, intention, volition behind your actions. What type of actions you commit? Remember earlier we were talking about the diamond. If I give you my most precious something that I have, let's say a diamond, and I give it to you, and I don't want it back, but I have a desire for it, and I'm saying to myself inside, like, I wish I didn't, that eliminates the meritorious aspect of that act. That beautiful act on the outside is very ugly on the inside, because the intention is bad. Now, to bring that sense of purity into your own actions really blossoms, really flourishes in the form of the Brahma Viharas. 
So we're going to talk about metta first. Metta usually is translated as uh, loving kindness, loving friendliness. And uh, is everything? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, they want to come in or? Okay. So when we talk about uh, metta, um, first we go back to uh, Subha. Subha was a, a, a man who came from Brahmanism. He was from a Brahman family. And he himself wanted to be reborn in a heavenly realm. Because that was what was being advocated at the time. Just like nowadays that I tried to describe earlier. So he had heard that the Buddha has the ability to go to different realms. To Brahma Lokas. And, and, and he can also teach people to be reborn there. And he approached the Buddha in such a way. And he was very genuine in his interest. And the Buddha seeing where the potential is, began explaining to this young man. Um, and then we get this in Majjhima Nikaya um, uh, Sutta, a middle-length discourses, this story of this man. And the Buddha tried to explain to him